Hey y'all, Data Guy here. Uh, and today I wanted to kind of go through a, you know, not ranked, but just compare and contrast uh, a few different types of NoSQL databases with the eye of giving you a sense of, hey, these are these solutions that are out there that are available to me. And this is the right one that fits perfectly with my use case. Uh, you know, with the massive array of technology available out there, you shouldn't be using something that isn't designed well for your particular use case because there's always an alternative that you can use these days. Um, and so today we're gonna be looking at NoSQL databases specifically. Um, and these types of databases have really gained significant popularity because of their ability to handle types of data that previously were, were borderline unprocessable by, by traditional databases. Um, things like graph data, things like uh, wide column stores, um, but also just non-standard documents, making sure that each piece of data that comes in your database doesn't have to fit a particular format. And so, they're really f particularly favored by applications that require large volumes of data, high scalability, and also flexibility uh, in terms of you know, how your database is structured and how you can design and store things. Um, and so what we'll aim to explore here is going over, let's say the top six uh, NoSQL databases and saying, hey, this is how each of them works, their best use cases, um, and some of their advantages and disadvantages. So you again, just have an idea of you know, what all these tools do, which one is best for you. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the first option up here is MongoDB. Um, Mongo Atlas has become one of the biggest database products of our side of our time. Um, and it's all built on MongoDB, which is a document oriented database that stores data in a flexible JSON documents. Um, so instead of, you know, a traditional data type, which you'll have, or like a, you know, table, each data point. So let's say a data point that contains all the information around, you know, me, George, as a person can be stored in a JSON format, similar to how you have, you know, match and group here. Um, I would have a JSON text path that, you know, to store, hey, this is George's name and this is the description of George. He's the data guy. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily need, every entry point wouldn't necessarily need to have a description. It would all need to have a title. Um, and you can see, you know, as it kind of flips through these different iterations, you can store kind of data as objects. Um, so rather than a user being a row entry in a database, they act as an object, a document. Um, that's where document database comes from. Um, and so MongoDB supports dynamic schemas. It's really designed to you know, work with data that's constantly changing um, and is just constantly evolving. And so it doesn't make you conform to any kind of rigid schema because each document can be its own independent entity. Um, and this makes it ideal for applications that require real-time analytics, content management, mobile devices, uh, IoT devices, because it's able to just constantly ingest data, process it, store it just as it arrives. Um, and it has a really high performance uh, for read and write operations. Obviously, if you able need to support big data at scale, you need to have really efficient read write operations. It has a very scalable and flexible data model as you can just kind of horizontally scale as many nodes as you need to produce more data sets. Um, and it also has a really rich query language. Um, you can query uh, your data in multiple different ways. You can see, you know, they're showing off AI, uh, but you know, really whatever language or however you want to query your data, you have that optionality to do so. So you can see here, JavaScript, Python, uh, Java, or C, uh, Objective-C, uh, all different ways for interacting with your data with Mongo and you just kind of have that optionality. Now on the downsides, in memory storage, the fact you're you know, storing this horizontally um, can lead to larger costs for larger data sets. Um, and it also might require additional management and optimization for really complex transactions. So you, know, you can see here, you're building a query. If you have lots of different documents that aren't of a standard format, it's going to be difficult to kind of set up standard complex transformation queries. Uh, so you're going to, even though you know, NoSQL is all about not needing a framework, you want to have somewhat of a framework here for you know how you're organizing and interacting with your data so that when it comes time to actually make use of it you know you're not stuck just kind of uh mucking around the bud trying to figure out oh where is this actual relevant data coming from uh, so that's mongodb in a nutshell and now we'll move on to apache cassandra so apache cassandra is a wide column nosql database that is really centered around a distributed decentralized architecture where you have many, many different nodes all storing a partition of the data. Um, and then that can all be combined together uh, when you actually need to query it. So you can query across all those different nodes. Um, so you can see here, you know, tested on clusters as large as a thousand nodes and hundreds of real world use cases. Um, and it, you know, it's similar to other NoSQL databases, but it really is stand or it's key feature uh, outside of just, you know, being distributed is it being a wide column store. Um, and a wide column database 
or wide column database uh, in the context of NoSQL is a database that organizes data structure into flexible columns that can be spread across multiple servers um, or database nodes. And the individual rows don't necessarily have to have the uh, exact same uh, names or, or column headings or even amount of columns. Um, so it kind of reduces the rigidity of, hey, yes, I have this format of data, of, you know, rows coming in and maybe I have a structure for it. But maybe some of these rows are going to have, you know, more data points than others. Um, and Cassandra is built in to allow that um, to through that wide column uh, store. Um, and so because Cassandra is really focused on distributed computing, you know, having this scale across many, you know, many hundreds, if, if not a thousand nodes, it has really excellent scalability and fault tolerance. Um, so it's really designed for. You know, if you have multiple data centers, you really can't lose any data. It needs to be all synchronized. You need to have, you know, basically no risk of it going down or or no to, and no data loss. Um, this is where Cassandra is, is going to come into play. It is really built for those really large scale, really tightly regulated or secured use cases where any portion of data loss could be catastrophic. Um, and it's also very linearly scalable. So you know, if you want more data in Cassandra, you just add some more nodes. Um, so it's not that complicated to scale, um, but it is quite complex to configure and manage, which leads me to my downsides. It's management complexity. Um, you need to have a very good understanding of distributed comp computing, how to align all these nodes, how to have them all work together, um, how to kind of design these distributed computing networks. Yes, Cassandra gives you the framework, but it doesn't, it's not going to do everything for you. It's not a SaaS offering where you're just going to go click button and now you have a new Cassandra database. This is something that will require a, a very rigorous setup process. Um, and also, it's not really designed for use cases that require like really complex transactions um, in your queries because you're replicating data across so many different nodes and running complex queries that need to go into all these thousand different nodes is just massively computationally expensive. Um, so it can do it, it will achieve it, but it just isn't really designed for it. It's more meant for, hey, I just need to keep track of all this large distributed data at scale and you know, kind of a data-like approach where downstream you know, you're pulling data out of it and, and, and using that um, to you know, do some, run some analytics queries. Now, the next database I have to talk about is Redis. Um, so Redis is a little bit different in that it's an in-memory data store. So you'll you know, provision it right alongside your infrastructure, uh, known for its speed and simplicity. Um, it supports various different data structures. You know, you can do strings, lists, sets, hash, sorted sets, um, and it's really meant for you know having kind of like an easy to use, uh, non-structured data, really close to the source of the data. Um, so for things like caching, for session management, for preserving, you know, when you log into a website, preserving the information around, you know, what you've done within that particular session, uh, real-time analytics, if you just want to have like a sidecar um, alongside where analytics we produce to, you know, store that data and then run some queries on it, um, or pub subsystems where you have that kind of approach, like publishing something and submitting it um, in that kind of linked method, um, because it has really extremely fast uh, read and write operations. And that's kind of what they're showing here is the ability to just go, hey, Known command hey. Um, let's see, ping long. Uh, and it responds really quickly. Um, and it is all built around kind of Lua and Redis functions here um, for with C, C, and Rust. Um, and so really, you know, supports data persistence, and that's what it's designed for, is persisting data, having it right alongside um, you know, wherever the application is, um, and you know, making sure that, hey, there, there's automatic failover, high availability, um, and just making sure that data is stored properly and easily accessible uh, when it needs to be within the context of an application. And you also have a rich, a rich structure of data structures. So you can see here, you know, in-memory data structure, you don't need to build anything from scratch. You already have options for how you want to structure your data, streams, sorted list, sets. Um, it already comes out of the box with Redis. However, downsides of this, um, limited data size memory uh, to memory. Um, you know, this is meant to be lots of small different instances. Um, you see, you know, millions of nodes uh, for clustering. So you're going to have many different small Redis data caches alongside different components of the infrastructure um, that help facilitate, you know, like data being, you know, flowing through your system or being collected um, and having it available right at the source of where it's collect collected. Um, and so it also requires careful management of memory and data size to prevent performance degradation because there isn't a ton of uh, room for error there. You know, you need to make sure you're right sizing your Redis environments for whatever use case they're supporting. Next on the docket, we have Couchbase. Um, and Couchbase is a distributed NoSQL document database. Again, similar to MongoDB, honestly, the most similar. Um, it combines the flexibility of document models with power of distributed architecture. Um, so 
Couchbase really has an emphasis on having behind the scenes a really distributed database architecture. Um, so you have you know many different nodes that are all supporting that a single Couchbase server. Um, and it's it's really suitable for a lot of the same use cases that MongoDB is. It's suitable for mobile applications, global applications, real-time analytics. Um, and you have to use their own SQL-like query language, uh, N1QL, to interact with it. So you do have to learn that, which isn't amazing. Um, so, you know, whether you like that language or not, you know, it's it's kind of up to you. Uh, but this is essentially kind of a competitor to MongoDB. Um, you know, they are... I would say are less about kind of like the Atlas style approach and are more about, hey, you know, you want to store and distribute, you know, store this data at scale in kind of a fault tolerant way. Um, so it's a combination of like the interaction and storage methods of MongoDB or the interaction and kind of front end methods of MongoDB with uh, more of a back end similar to um, Cassandra. And so it offers really strong consistency and high performance. You have, you know, consistency of a service like MongoDB and then also high performance from distributed computing. Um, it has really effective synchronization and replication features, um, which can be useful for mobile applications, especially. Um, but on the downsides, it's pretty complex to scale and manage, um, you know, and you also might require additional hardware for optimal performance. Um, so, you know, they do have their kind of couch-based server offer offering, um, you know, you can do a cloud deployment on your terms. They have a couple of different offers deploying it, but you're also going to be doing some of the management of that deployment. So it's less of a kind of push button service as something like Mongo um, might be. Um, so I'd say put, Couchbase and Mongo are probably the most similar um, in terms of NoSQL databases. Now, the next NoSQL database is a bit different from the other ones, and that is Neo4j. Um, Neo4j is actually a graph database that's designed to store and query data in the form of graphs rather than tables. Um, so, as you might expect, it excels at handling connected data because it can visualize those kind of relationships. Um, and so you can see here just kind of some examples like what that would look like. Um, but essentially, it's really ideal for social networks, network recommendation engines, fraud detection, um, network and IT operations, anything where you need to see like how many different nodes or data points are connected to each other and the relationships between them. Um, so it's really highly efficient in querying complex and you know, deeply connected data. Um, and it has a flexible schema because it doesn't conform to traditional schemas. Um, it really is about, hey, you know, what are these relationships between these different data points rather than relying on kind of like a specific schema. And you can kind of see an example here where it's like, hey, a patient name, they also have a social security number, they have a phone number, they have a health diagnosis, home address, um, and you can trace the data as it goes through your network. You can see how, you know, a patient relies on a doctor um, and so on and so forth. You really get to visualize all those kind of relationships. However, the disadvantage of this is there is a learning curve for understanding graph databases. Uh, you know, this is a totally new paradigm if you're used to working with SQL, at least with NoSQL, it's, it's conceptually somewhat the same, um, but here it is really a whole new world. Um, and also scalability can be challenging compared to other NoSQL databases. You know, as you can see, you might imagine when this amount of graph points or data points increases, these can quickly become just like, you know, a web of pixels where you don't really understand what's happening. Um, so they do have their limitations and, you know, how much they can actually do. And now, finally, it wouldn't be a video on uh, just any topic without it showing the AWS offering. Um, so AWS has a NoSQL database called DynamoDB, um, which you can kind of see how it works here. But it is a fully managed NoSQL database, so you, all bells included. You don't manage anything provided by Amazon Web Services. Um, and so it offers key value and document data structures. Um, so a little bit more limited in the types of data you can interact with, a um, little bit, you know, just limited in the customizability of it, but the trade-off for that is it is fully managed. You don't really have to do a lot of setup. It's kind of out of the box um, and it doesn't require like any overhead or maintenance or any people that are dedicated to actually maintaining and just, or, you know, making sure the database functions. Um, and it's perfect for web scale applications that, you know, require low latency data access at really any scale. Um, so, you know, even across like millions or billions of transactions, things like gaming, things like IOT, mobile applications. Um, these are great use cases for DynamoDB. Um, and it's also, Seamless scalability, Again, it's managed service, it'll scale up as needed, um, and it's integrated with AWS services just like any other AWS product. If you're a big AWS, AWS shop, you can just kind of slot this in. Uh, but the downsides are you pay for that convenience, it can become quite expensive at scale, and you're also pretty limited and tied to the AWS ecosystem. So you know, if you're a multi-cloud approach, you, you might want to consider going with a less kind of vendor locked-in um, option. Uh, but that 
is all the NoSQL databases that I thought were fit to cover um, and were fit to look at today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it helpful, and I hope you know which NoSQL database to use now. Uh, but above all else, have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.